one of the uses. It's most commonly used, for example, during sun dances. And they're very often hung on bushes uh, before ceremonies and during ceremonies. And, and they're sometimes hung inside the sweat lodges when there's a medicine sweat. But they're also used as prayers which are healing emotional distress. Most commonly, grief, most commonly. Um, and in particular, the, it's often used when a, when parents, ch a child dies and the parents um, make prayer ties to cope with their grief. But that's fairly not, uh, well, not understood. Mostly it's thought of as just sending prayers, another way of sending prayers to the creator. And this particular hour, I'd like to talk about how they're used for healing extreme emotional pain. PTSD, grief, rage, betrayal, resentments, all those kinds of things which not only are powerful in terms of their intensity, but tend to hang around. So we can repress them and then they'll come back and they don't seem to get just finally be done with. And prayer ties can help significantly in those kinds of situations. And that's what I want to talk about. The second misunderstanding, I think, and I've been at least partially guilty of this earlier, is that there are a lot of videos that show you how to make a prayer tie. And uh, they all leave out the most important stuff, which surprises me. But because almost all of them are presented in English, it's easier to understand. So I want to talk about that. Now, the originally prayer ties were actually made with leaves and with twine made from plants. It wasn't until uh, the Europeans came over and they had began to have trade goods that we had uh, cotton cloth and uh, cotton string. And those things replaced gradually over the tens of decades, the use of the leaves and the, the handmade strings made from vegetation. So the first thing I need to talk about is how our languages differ. The, the North American languages, and I only, I only really am aware of the two largest groups, Algonquinian and, and the Athabascan, and those are huge. Between most of the tribes, probably 90% of all the tribes speak a dialect of one of those two languages. In English, when we say sister or niece or auntie, we don't have to say my niece is a girl. That's redundant. The word niece tells you implicitly we're talking about a female. And that's important. Almost all the European languages are like that. They have words which imply um, gender. And neither the Algonquian nor Athabascan languages have that. They have something else. And when I say bear, rabbit, wapoos, when I say that, you don't know what gender it is. What you know is it has a spirit. And that's implied in the word. And just like I cannot say mother without the implication of female in English, I cannot say wapus in Cree without implying the spirit of that rabbit. And when 
you hear prayers in with all my relations, they're talking about those other things, the spirits of the rabbit and the eagle and the drum and the knife and shield and the teepee and the mountains and the water, the rivers. And because of the difference in English, then the explanations of the prayer ties become different. And so I want to introduce them. Now in English, tobacco. And tobacco is a thing in English. Doesn't have any gender, it's an it. It's just a dead object. And yet you have to use tobacco to make a prayer tie. And if you're hearing that in English, it fogs the understanding or increases the misunderstanding. The next thing you have to have when you're building prayer ties is print. Well, that's pretty high. This is all print. This is red print. This is yellow print. And print is nothing more than cotton dyed in solid colors, navy print, green print. And print in English is just cloth. And it has no life of its own, it's just a thing. This is stuff in English. In Cree, print like tobacco has a spirit. The linguists call it animate. Well, I always thought that was a little strange because even a dead bear has a spirit, which certainly isn't animate. But again, you have this difference where in English, cloth is cloth. In Cree, cloth is very close to the equivalent of a person. And I'll talk about that and expand on it a bit later. And finally, to make prayer ties, you have to have string. I use hemp string. Most people are still using cotton string. I find that hemp is a little stronger. It has durability, better durability. It's a little stiffer, easier to work. But most people are using cotton string. But the point that's important here is that it's organic, as is the cotton print. The original trade print was dyed with organic materials. So the cloth itself carried with it the notion of the spirit of the leaves and the string carries with it the spirit of the string that used to be made from vegetation. So we have these three things which in English are dead and which in Cree are living entities with spirit. <laughs> you know, you can just think, understand yourself. That's different. That's different. And if I take the way your t people are taught online about making prayer ties, well, essentially what they're saying is, I take a lifeless thing, tobacco, and I put it on another lifeless thing, a little piece of print, and then I tie it all up with another little lifeless thing called a string, and lo and behold, I have created a completely lifeless thing, a bundle. And you know, that doesn't work very well when it comes to ceremony, ritual, and healing. It just doesn't. And the problem is people don't understand. So we have in Cree then our spiritual helpers. Tobacco. And tobacco is most often referred to as a grandfather. Grandfather tobacco. Now, why grandfather, you know? Well, grandfathers, you know, in Cree country, grandfathers are interesting people. First, they're the wisdom teach teachers. They're the culture bearers. 
the wisdom keepers of the culture, the wisdom bearers, they tell the stories. And they are storytellers. And they're very good listeners. And very often when a person needs help, who do they go to for prayer? So they go to their grandfather. And they ask their grandfather if they won't pray for them. And their grandfathers do that. And it starts amazingly early. When my grandson Zachary was about two and was really able to walk and talk, it would be evening and ready to be time for him to go to bed. And he would be in his onesies, you know. And... Uh, He'd come up to me while I'm sitting on the sofa, and he would have a cigarette in his hand. And he'd say, Musum, grandfather, Musum, tell me a story, Musum. Tell me a story. And he would give me the tobacco as to honor his request of telling him a story two years old. That's how early it begins in the culture of the traditional people. Okay? Uh, I remember when uh, I first was getting ready to go to a workshop in Miami, and actually asked me, and she was asking me what title she should put on the publicity. And I'm really puzzled over that. I really did. I had a hard time figuring out what to say. And I finally told her, why don't you tell them it's Muslim Kusirawa? And of course, she didn't know what that meant, but she trusts me. And, but she asked, and I said, well, that's Grandfather Casitawa. I said, that's a title I feel honored to carry, and, and I do. And so we have Grandfather Tobacco, a good listener, a message carrier, a wisdom keeper, and is noted for carrying your messages to the great spirit. He carries it in his smoke and he carries it in his being and he passes your messages on to the great spirit. So that's the first of the helpers. And we have Prince. And print, I've, now this is not free. I've done this to help people who are not of native ancestry. I call this print because print in English doesn't mean much. It's a dead word. Sister print begins to imply the kind of relationship we might have with our sisters. And it also has a secondary meaning of the women who devote themselves to the creator of their understanding. We call them nuns, typically. But every religion has titles for women who retreat into residences and retreat into a life of servants to the creator as they understand it. And so this is Sister Print. And I will use that term to help you understand that print has both uh, an emotional sense in terms of our relationship, like a sister, and a spirit, like the blessed nuns who devote their lives to the God of their understanding. And like the nuns uh, and many older sisters, they are in a way uh, protectors, especially of young children. And so when we're making ties, we take a small piece of print, about a two inch square. I'll put that on the background so you can see it. That's an inch and a half or two inches of their roundabouts of print. And we're going to put the tobacco on print. And the print is blessed. The print is a 
like like a sister, a nun that will hold that tobacco and safety. And then we need, of course, string. And string for the, this is also not Cree. I'm calling this brother string for precisely the same reasons I call Prince sister. Brother has a, a human family relationship that we understand. And hopefully we love our brothers, hopefully. But brothers also carries the, the connotation of the monk and the males, equivalent of the nuns who devote their lives to the creator of their understanding. So I do that and I talk about brother string to encourage my non-Cree, non-Native people to understand that this is a spiritual being that you are in relationship with not a dead thing, not a dead thing. And so we have the three parts. And if I, if I follow what I would do in Cree as opposed to what we did in English, I would say, you know, I take Grandfather print or grandfather tobacco, and I place him in the care of Sister Print, and then I tie up the bundle and ask Brother String to tie it up and protect the message. I tried to think of an analogy in English that would help people understand, and the one I came up with is. Imagine your beloved partner is overseas, not with you, and you want to write a love letter. Well, you get out a piece of paper and you write on it. And what we're doing here with prayer ties is we're dictating a message to grandfather tobacco. And when we finish dictating that message, we slide it into the envelope. That's closing up the, the sister print. And then finally we lick the envelope, close it so that the message doesn't fall out in route. And that's what Brother String does for us. He locks the door to protect the message and stands guard that it doesn't fall out before it arrives to the creator. That's a kind of Cree way of looking at it. Right. So we, we send a message to the creator. And we bundle it up. in the care of print, and we guard it and lock it safely away with string. And that's the difference between what we see in YouTube and what actually is going on when a native North American Indian is making prayer ties. Now, I'm not going to tell you how to make prayer ties particularly. There's three uh, decent videos on the subject on YouTube, and the links are in the chat. Uh, and actually, it was kind enough to put them in chat so you can see the, the links. And if you can't read chat, I'll be happy to send them to your email or, or something. We'll get, to, get them to you one way or another. Prayer ties are a ceremony, but they're a ceremony mostly you do by yourself. And when we're talking about healing, we're talking about trying to heal your emotional dis 
distraught, your emotional pain, one bite at a time. I have a Cree friend very early on when I went to work. He said, well, you know, we can eat an elephant one bite at a time. And prayer ties are kind of like that. They heal our emotional distress one bundle at a time. And I'll give you a demonstration because I've made some. And I'll talk you through the first ones and then I will make one. I have four made. The first bundle talks about the birth of my son, Bill, who died and killed himself in January of 1993. That's the foil. Now I'll make the last one and then I'm going to close it off because this can go on clearly, I hope you understand for a long time. And if it happens that you need to take a break because life endures and you need to haul water and chocolate, you put made materials aside with respect and go haul water and chocolate. And when you come back, you can take them out, smudge them again, and continue on where you left off. And you may find that you have to do that many times before you have healed whatever it was you're seeking healing for. But let me tell you about the fifth bundle, because the fifth story, because It's one of my favorite, and it relates to the second one. We were hiking, backpacking as a family, and we went to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. We went to Angel Creek. And at Angel Creek, there's a small camping site there that the Park Service maintains, and it has a shelter, typical, you know, half walls, waist high, and then open space and then a roof and inside there's tables, picnic tables mostly, and there's a grill for heating wood and cooking. And I took off my backpack and everybody else did the same and we're putting them on the tables. And then I went down to the creek, boots, clothes and all, and just laid down in the water. It was 114 degrees at the bottom of the canyon at Angel Creek that particular day. And I was roasting. So I'm lying in the creek, looking up at the blue sky quietly, and I hear this voice, sir, sir. I look kind of looking around, but I'm not getting out of the water. I'm just looking around and I don't see anything. And I kind of sit up. And there's a woman in the ranger Uniforms, yes, sir. Do you have children with you? And I said, Oh, yes, ma'am. Do you want to have, have a little boy? And she described the clothes he's wearing. I said, Yeah, that sounds like my son. She said, I'm going to need your help, sir. <laughs> right. So I got out of the creek and I climbed the bank and got up to where she was and she points. And there above the shelter at the top of the cliff was Billy. He climbed up the side of the wall and then he shimmied up to get to the roof and then he got on the roof and then he was butted up against the cliff and then he climbed the cliff and he's up about, I don't know, 30 feet, somewhere in that neck of the woods. And he's perfectly fine. He's waving. Dad! Mom! But the ranger is having deep concerns about his safety because she doesn't know how he's going to get down. And she said, sir, how well does your boy follow instructions? 
I said, oh, he'll, he'll do whatever you tell him to if I want him to. Said, really? I said, oh, yeah. She says, kids always want to climb down facing outward so they can see. And they always fall if they do that. He has to be able to climb facing the cliff, hugging the cliff. I said, and if he will do that, I will tell him how to find the footholds and the handholds and whatnot. But he'll have to reach and, you know, if he freezes up there, he's going to fall. He won't freeze. And I told him the lady was going to help him get down. I just did do what she told him. And he said, sure, Dad. No big deal. And so Grandfather, the ranger, talked him down. Calm. Everybody was happy. He said, no problem. What's ever dangerous? And, <laughs> and with that, Grandfather, to close that particular story, and Again, thank you for letting me and the rest of our family share that part of Bill's life. We love him, and we love him still. I hi, all our relations. And I kind of skipped a few steps because I was telling the story. But in that process, as I'm telling the story, I would take a bit of tobacco. And I will tell you, for those who make it, I have my hands in the tobacco pouch and I'm rubbing the tobacco between my fingers so it's a little ball because it's easier and less messy to handle if I do that. And then I put the ball in the center of sister print. And that's when I tell the story. There, right there. Grandfather Tobacco, this is my story about my son, Bill. And when I finish that story, I follow one of the methods shown in the videos that I've sent giving you. In this case, I'm folding it in thirds and bringing the two together. And now I have the bundle and I have string and I make essentially a noose. There are other knots that you can use, but I put the noose over the bundle in my hand and then I pull it tight. And there is the bundle with the story of my son climbing the cliff at Angel Creek about 1970. Now, I will stop this story here. Um, but when you're making prayer ties with the purpose to heal your grief, I hope the spotlight of your video you don't want to see. Hmm. Um, you may make, depending on how deep your grief or how angry, how enraged you are, or how much you really detest the way your senator is voted, or why you're so angry that the the repair shop at Ford has messed up your car or cost you three times what they said it would cost, whatever it is. You may find yourself having to make not 10, not 20, not 30, but 40, 50, 100. I've seen people make a thousand. Each telling of the story with little differences about what it is that's upsetting you is a bite off that elephant of pain that you're experiencing. And no one but you can know when you've eaten enough of the element, elephant to feel healed. No one can tell you that. 
I do know people who've made four or five, and my instinct is to say that wasn't a very serious problem. But only you can decide in ceremony when you're making that last tie, and there is a difference in the way telling the story. There is a difference in the emotional weight that you are carrying because you have been slowly, bit by bit, sharing and surrendering that weight to the great mystery. And only you will know when you have made enough ties. And if you need to take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, and you can only spend 20 minutes once in a while, that's what you need to do to help yourself. No one can set your schedule for you. No one can tell you how many you need to do per day or per hour. Only you can know the answer to that. But I will promise you that if you continue to do it, you will heal whatever it is has been tearing you apart. Okay. I will stop there. And I will my 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 son's bundles, and I will return them to the mother. And that is probably the final step. When you're really feeling well, or better enough that you're okay with living with what you're living with, then there are traditionally four ways to re, to deal with your bundles to send them off. The most common is to burn them in fire. But you can offer them to water and put them in a creek or a lake or a river, the ocean. You can hang them on a bush. That's very common in sun dances. You can actually bury them. You dig a hole and you bury them with ceremony. So when you see these videos of how to make a prayer tie, the thing that's missing in all of them is you. It's you and your understanding that when you're doing this in the traditional ways, you're dealing with beings that are your relatives and they are sacred, just as you are sacred. And it is in the four of you, grandfather, tobacco, sister, print, brother, string, and thee, that make the bundle sacred and allow the message to be carried to the Great Spirit. And that's it. I'm open for questions. Hi, hi. I have a question. Ask a question. Oh, um, when somebody did that, uh, she came to the house when I was in Tennessee um, and she was passing and she wanted to pass on to me because I, I do spirit work and other things. She wanted to pass me on a bundle and she said it was important um, and she did the prayer north, south, east, west and uh, added a little bit more of something to the whole thing. That, that, that is that is tell your story. You can tell your story from each of the four directions. You know, the, starting with the east and the vision, and then moving. Now, each tribe has different meanings to the directions because it depends where they live. Their environment affects the way they define the medicine wheel. But it doesn't matter which one you use. It's a matter of you because that's your intention to walk the wheel. I think if you know that and you understand what you're doing, that's a wonderful thing to do. And I think that helps with the mindfulness of doing prayer ties because you really are doing ritual. You're not just building little bundles, you know, which is sort of what they teach you when you're looking at these crazy videos. I mean, I, I love the fact that people have made them and can see them, but they're leaving out all the things that make them valuable. 
And if you understand the medicine wheel and the directions and want to do it that way, I would encourage you to do that. I don't didn't want for this particular purpose to have to teach people about the medicine wheel on top of the prayer ties. But I would always recommend that you do what the elders ask of you. I don't care what it is. They're the ones you are face to face with and those are the ones you need to follow. Does that answer your question? Anyway. There's a question in the chat. Um, all the pre print was red in your example. Do you usually make all of the same color or do you vary the colors in the ties? I, it, it depends on what you want. And again, like with Devada's question, it depends how much you understand about the colors. Now I picked red which is from a Cree point of view, both the East, which is vision. It's also the woman's power color. And I tend to use that um, for myself, unless I'm doing something for a male, in which case I use blue. And if I'm doing something for, uh, that deals with physical issues of healing. I will use green. I almost never mix them, but it's very common to mix them. Um, some dancers almost always mix them because they want to pray to each of the four directions and they will often make seven of some one color and then shift to make seven of another color and, then, and they're following the medicine wheel to go around. Um, so, I don't think the great mystery is picky. I really don't. And I think if you do understand what you're doing and it increases your mindfulness and helps you to do, go move through the ceremony, you should do that. And if you feel an impulse to do that, make them all one color, make them different colors. I think you should trust your inner guidance. I don't, I tend to make them solid all the time. I will make them all white, I'll make them all blue, I'll make them all red, uh, unless I'm out of print. <laughs> and then, you know, I might have to slip a different color in because I'm all out of the one I'm using. And again, I don't think the great mystery is picky. I believe in, in a really friendly universe and a friendly God. And anything that helps you be mindful and helps you maintain sacred space, go with it. Anything that I've suggested and doesn't feel right to you, don't do it. Because ultimately, your inner voice is more important than anything going on externally. That's my position on that. I don't think there's a right way except be mindful. Don't just make things. Just don't make things. Just don't make pouches to make pouches because you don't know what you're doing. You know? um, that's a waste of your time. <laughs> I don't think it harms anything. But you could be doing better. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that people who come to your groups are all, all understand mindfulness in some fashion, whether they call it meditation or being centered or, you know, working in sacred space, which is how I perceive it. Um, you're not likely to get people who are just going to make stuff. Yeah. I trust that. And I would remind you to leave out the section where I'm telling the story of some. Other questions? Did I answer your question? I guess I need to check that. Yeah, that uh, she would probably say, Carol is uh, 
something very interesting. That's right. So, Kisitwa, first of all, I must say I'm feeling so moved and so blessed um, at how you, you shared such uh, beautiful, uh, your experience of the prayer ties. And because I remember that when we, whenever we have done it, I don't think I have focused so much on pain as on, I've always, uh, whenever I, I thought of it as whatever is the wish in my mind, but then now I'm realizing if there's a wish in your mind, that means you're feeling a lack and that lack itself is pain. So <laughs> exactly. every time, every time you, you teach us, we learn something new. It, it, this, but this really has been such a blessing and still is because we are continuing because I have a question. Because I remember when you had come here to Miami and we had done the prayer ties in the, in the circle and you kindly said, yes, you will allow us to do it in that way so you could teach us a few things. And I remember you had told us that it has four corners and the corners themselves can represent directions. Yes. Can you expand on that a little bit? Well, it has to do with what was asking about, I mean, within the circle are the four, are, are seven directions, but the four cardinal directions on the Mother Earth from Father Sky's point of view um, are typically symbolized in a square, usually with two, with arrows on both sides, okay? And so the squares do that. Now I have to tell you, I think that's a recent develop, recent being several hundred years, because leaves don't come in squares, right? And the origins were leaves. But we can add complexity. I, I look at Hindu. I mean, the complexity as the culture ages and grows becomes more and more complex. It gets fancier and the diagrams get greater and, you know, that's the way it works, uh, human development. And somehow the natives in America, North America, have kept it simple over at least 17,000 years. And those four square as a square is really recent, relatively speaking. Uh, but it, it fits because there's a square, those directions are there and so that's so important in every tribe. And you can look up any medicine wheel and look at what the directions represent, and they will be different for different tribes. Again, because it depends on the environment they were in. But they will all offer a business if you travel all the way around. I mean, they say life itself is that way. You know, you're born and you come around and you're, you're children grandchildren, you become like I am, and I return to my childhood, you know, and they will tell you, you know, you lose your teeth, and you become incontinent, and you need a cane to walk, and you're like a baby, you're going back to that childhood image. That's a very native way of thinking about aging, which, by the way, is a lot more comforting than the way we think about it, because nobody's surprised that you're losing your teeth, and Nobody needs to get a facelift or uh, shots to take the wrinkles out or, you know, it, it doesn't happen. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that's a, a distraction in Indian country. So if you want to use the directions in the Cree, The vision people are the red people, and that is the sun, the rising sun, the new day, the beginnings of things, red. And the south is the entrance to Sky Nation. It's the way spirits move in and out. And it's also the place of timing. Everything to do with timing, having a sense of time. When people say go with the flow, they're talking about the south, because in the north, where the Cree live, the south is when everybody moves 
to the campgrounds to have pow what we call powwows now because the land will support more people. But in the winter, they can't crowd like that. They would, there's none of food. Uh, and then you go around to the east, which is the Thunderbird, because they're by the Rocky Mountains. And when the, when the thunder roars, the thunder roars, believe me. <laughs> it's loud. And that's the Thunderbird. And that's the balance to with vision is intellect and reasoning and thoughtfulness consideration of what's going on. And then you get to the north and, you know, the north is, that's our gift, white people. And uh, that's white because they're in the north and that's snow and, and the wind is the north wind. And the thing about the north wind in Cree country is it's moving. When it moves in the winter, it moves. And it moves and blows. And if you're not appropriately dressed and prepared, you die. You die. You freeze to death. And you can do that in minutes when the north wind's blowing. 50, 60 below zero. That wind blows and you're not dressed. Oh, really. And that's how the Cree see the white man. Because you know, the north wind doesn't know that you died. It isn't even aware that you were down there getting cold. It just keeps moving. And that's how the Cree see the gift of the white man is that we just are on the go all the time. And it's funny you see that, you can see that played out in small children. What do we put our kids in, the small ones, you know, the white folks? Jumpers, scoot arounds, you know. What are Cree babies in? Moss bags. They're dressed up like little mummies. And they learn by watching. They don't learn by doing. And it's a funny, different way of learning. I've seen teenagers, 14-year-old kids, they'll see a guitar, somebody be playing, and they've never seen it before, except on television or something, and they'll say, gee, can I try that? And they'll sit there and play a tune, because they watched. Now, I got up there, and they want me to dance, and I'm dancing powwow dances I've never danced in my life, and I'm constantly looking at my feet, and I step on anybody, making sure I get the toes hitting first, and I'm awkward, you know? Because I got to go through my head before I get to my feet. The kids aren't like that when they learn from watching. They sit there for the first two years. They don't get to move around much. And it shows in the way their cultures are different. Um, I remember we were going in to pick berries deep in the bush, and uh, Eva, my Cree wife, kept looking back. And I said, Why are you looking back? She said, I want to know how to get home. <laughs> Duh! <laughs> you know, she, she knows what it'll look like when she's going the other way. I wouldn't have known what it looked like going the other way. So, how simple can it be? Um, a difference that could kill you. Oh, yeah. Wait, ask me to Are wait. I have some quick question. I want because because of the timing, and in case someone leaves before, I want to say this because to me it's very important. Because I think one of the because I learned all these prayer tie ceremonies and everything from you, in uh, reference to hoop reiki, the hoop ceremonies that we used to do every full moon. And uh, those were just, we have learned so much and, and transformed and, and got into a path so much because of that. So I really recommend anyone who has not been through the paths to look at the chat and, and, and look through all the lists. But more, than, more important, uh, the Cree have the tradition which Kisitwa taught us of gifting. And gifting is not a gift you give. It is an expression of thanks that we give to the host, the teacher, the ceremony um, guide, anyone who has given us something. And, uh, and I remember all of us used to say what is appropriate and what is not. And he said, 
uh, it's only the, 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 the Western education. And even if you're in India, you have the Western kind of education because it's very, this is right and that must be wrong. And in a way also, can I give the least possible, you know, so these are the, the little things that we all have. What is the value of something? Whereas the Cree would just give from their heart whatever is the most valuable they feel, I think, to the person they're gifting and to themselves. You know, so, so that because it's an expression of gratitude. So uh, that also, I have put up the links uh, in the chat box. And of course, you can always ask me later, because I feel that what the, the lessons, the, the teaching we have received today have been just amazing. I'm sure you, yeah, even though I've learned so many years from you, this has been really wonderful. Okay, anyone yeah, has any other questions? questions. You can unmute yourselves if you want to and you please come on uh, on video. And Thank you. I appreciated that. Really. And it meant a lot, especially because I had been gifted the amazing gift of the medicine wheel and something so profound as earth and sky working. So thank you. Uh, I do want to give one last gratitude, you know, um, what's a teacher without students? And what's, I really believe that we teach what we need to learn. And every time I go through prayer ties, I myself learn more about them and become clearer in my ability to explain them. And I couldn't do that work for you folks. And I do appreciate that. And with that, I'm going to save you having to throw me out. But, oh, there's a question. Katie? She's muted. I think she... Maybe she's just is waving goodbye. Or is she leaving? I don't know. Okay. Come. Unmute yourself. Thank you. Kasido, I just wanted to clarify. You were saying as you're making the tie, then you are telling the story. Yeah, well, normally when I put the tobacco on the little square print, that's when I start telling the story to grandfather tobacco. Okay. And Thank I don't you. fold it up until I'm done Got it. Thank right. you. I'm actually going to bless you all by leaving. Good night, all. <laughs>